So this is a really quick video to talk about FastFlux and how do we validate IP addresses to see if they're part of a FastFlux. So this is a posting a couple years ago talking about a FastFlux. And the key to a FastFlux is, is that the name server and the machines that are the web servers are actually compromised boxes. Uh, the web servers themselves are actually just proxies back to the actual malicious server. FastFlux allow an attacker to remain alive much longer than they would if they were trying to just use bulletproof hosting and try to survive. So what that means is, is that when you wind up trying to block an IP address or to investigate or get law enforcement to investigate an IP address, it turns out that these machines are just compromised boxes from around the world. And so not only is it difficult to work with foreign law enforcement, also you just can't wind up blocking an IP address uh, in order to uh, stop the attack because the IP addresses, both the name server and the IP address, are always changing. So how do we know when we're dealing with one? Well, the first one, the first way to take a look at is that when somebody buys an infrastructure or pushes out an infrastructure, normally the name servers and the d machines are all within the same domain. So you can see in this example of this conversation, we can see that the name servers or belong to different class IP addresses, and so don't the scattering of the host names that are resolving to this. Now, the first question that somebody might say is, well, can I just detect FastFlux because I see all these different IP addresses? And that answer is no. That this technique of round-robin distribution allows sites like Amazon and Akamai to deliver web services around the world faster, more efficiently. And so, really, fast fluxes act like RRDSs. The only difference is, is of course, these are made up of compromised machines, and it's not for efficiency, but to hide. So if we take a look at these two name servers, and we look them up, we wouldn't get a reverse DNS. And what a reverse DNS is, is when I ask you who owns this machine, you kind of query the local domain owner, and the domain owner says, ah, this machine belongs to so-and-so. Often, if it belongs to a static or a dynamic hosting system, we're going to get that response to say this is static or this is dynamic. So if we were to take a look at MaxMind UIP, and we were to take a look at these two IP addresses, we'd find that one is in Russia and one is in Miami, and they belong to different ISPs. That's not a dead giveaway. We could also look at the time to lives and other information to determine how often these change. But the reality is, is that these are a good example of the first thing we're looking for, which is their name servers. And if we keep on querying, what we should find over time is that the name servers themselves are changing. Now, if we take a look at the IP addresses that are in this list, we can also go back to MaxMind database, and we find that they're scattered all over the world. They go all the way from places in Pakistan to Russia to Hungary to China to Japan. And so this is a really good example of, hey, this thing is spread out. Now, what is this thing reverse DNS, and how can we use it? So let's take a look at a site. And I grabbed this Brazilian site as an example. And let's do a reverse DNS query. So we can we copy that, and let's bring up a terminal. And a, a reverse DNS is a dig. And really, we're just answer, we only want to focus on the answer. So if I go ahead and dig this address, I get a response that says, hey, this address is in Brazil, and it belongs to an ISP. And this is a good example when we see the, the IP address here appears backwards here, and that's because DNS stores the IP addresses backwards. And so the DNS system is actually auto-generating this name. And we can see that it belongs to an ISP. This is the ISP, and they belong in Brazil. Now we can randomly grab another one. Let's see how good we do. Let's grab one in Russia and see what type of response we get back. So we'll bring up that command and we don't get anything. Now this happens a lot that, that either the name service doesn't have a local name service that's responding or that the owners of that IP address haven't posted a reverse DNS. 
So let's just try another one just to find out if it's a fluke. And here we go. So this one does China. And again, you can see, or sorry, Japan. And again, you can see the IP address and see its format, again, is backwards. And this is a good example that these are generated DNS names. And that's what we're looking for. If we go through this entire list, I'd say about 70 to 80% of these will wind up showing up as static or dynamic IP addresses with the IP address in it. In fact, often you might see something that says static or dynamic in the name. So I hope this clarifies what we're looking for. We look for fast flux and trying to validate the IP addresses. We kind of do a number of things. One thing is, is that we can grab the name and do a who is lookup to see who owns that IP address. The other is to take a look at the name service and to say, what's the time to live, which we didn't go through in this example. And this example, what we did was we took a look at the geo IP placement along with doing reverse DNS lookups to see what is the actual name of this machine. Now one thing I didn't do is to say, hey, let's take a common machine to see what it would look like if I went to a common web service. And so 8888 being the Google DNS, and lo and behold, it tells us exactly that that is the public DNS for Google. And that's the advantage of reverse DNSs is, is that well-established IP addresses will have well-established reverse DNSs. A long time ago, we used to use reverse DNS a lot to validate mail. And so the reverse DNS is a very useful for figuring out where the IP belongs. And most ISPs and organizations provide a reverse DNS lookup.